Nick C. On the RPF, people are generally poorly fed and sleep deprived, but they also get auditing and sec checking. At the same time, I remember hearing that anytime anyone gets on an e-meter, they're supposed to be well fed and well rested. So how does the RPF manage to keep Scientology working in this situation? This is a really good question because, and I'll go into all the details of it when I eventually get this, this book on the whole subject written because it has a lot to do with human rights and, and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, on, a, on a pragmatic, on a practical level, let me go ahead and, uh, and tackle this. Um, when I hit the RPF, I was, um, uh, you know, re regular, ordinary Sea Org member. I mean, a lot of my day was spent sitting in a chair or uh, walking around a bit here and there, but I was not at all prepared for the physical demands of what the RPF entails. Uh, I was worn out. I mean, I was just exhausted at the end of every day for the first, for, for quite a while, actually, because the RPF's physical demands are intense. I was also in a really, really bad place mentally when I first uh, hit the ground on the RPF, and I was just not doing well. Um, and, and then I had this dietary adjustment because I had, as a Sea Org member, you get, you know, a little bit of money every week. Well, I was used to spending that money mostly in the canteen, uh, which was a place that was provided for Sea Org members to get snacks and food and meal alternatives if you didn't like what was being served in the main mess. And when they were doing curry and stuff, I would just, you know, because their curry was really bad. So I'd, I'd go in the canteen and get meals. Well, now suddenly I was on a quarter pay. Uh, so the most I was going to get in a week was 11 bucks. So I had to make that 11 bucks stretch. And also there were suddenly limitations on my diet too. No Cokes, uh, no, we weren't supposed to be eating sugary products. Now this was not written anywhere. This was just the culture of the RPF. So you have the written flag orders that direct how the RPF is supposed to conduct itself and what it's supposed to do and how the members are supposed to act. And then you have these unwritten rules. So for example, I went into the canteen and got some cereal, I think. I think it was some, some sugary cereal for breakfast one time because we were, I was suddenly having to eat the eggs, the runny eggs that were being served. I, I never, I would either skip breakfast when I was in the Sea Org or I would get a muffin or something, but I wouldn't be, oh, that was it, I got a muffin. I, it wasn't cereal, it wasn't sugary cereal. I got, a, I got a, an apple muffin or something for breakfast one day because I couldn't deal with the runny eggs and stuff quite yet. And, um, and I got a lot of crap for that from other, they, they were stopping by and making a point to tell me no sugary foods when you're on the RPF, that's a luxury and we don't do that here. So I couldn't even have an apple muffin, right? Um, so then this question comes in of how do you be sessionable? That's the term that's used in Scientology for being well-fed, well-rested. Because when you go into an auditing session, you are supposed to be well-fed and well-rested. Well, the way the RPF is, is, conducts itself and put together, you are on the edge all the time of being well-rested and well-fed. I mean, well, these are relative terms. And you learn in this environment, this, this extremely tough environment of the RPF, that you are not going to be coddled in any way, shape, or form. No one cares about your personal problems on the RPF. Not really. Um, you know, they just want you to do the program. There's a series of steps you do. It's the same steps for, for it's the same framework of steps for everybody. The, the specifics of some of those steps will be different, but everybody is doing basically the same general program. And it's a long, intense program, and it's gonna take hundreds of hours of auditing. I think my total was, my, my twin told me near the end that we had done a thousand hours of uh, false purpose rundown auditing uh, on me over the course of the RPF. I, of course, delivered that to my twin as well. So you're on this thin edge the whole time. Um, you know, again, runny eggs, toast, you know, milk for, for breakfast um, or water, uh, you know, when we had those things. Sometimes Sunday mornings, we'd have a bit more of a better breakfast. They would kind of splurge a little bit with a pancakes or, uh, you, you know, something like that. Uh, the meals were um, not non-nutritious, but they weren't, they just didn't taste very good. They weren't very good. But Here's the other thing that happens. Um, you start working so hard that your body just kind of doesn't really care anymore what your mouth is telling it. I mean, you're so hungry. 
You so need energy, and this food that you're being served is all you've really got. I mean, you can go into the canteen every now and again, but you only got 11 bucks every seven day period. So you gotta make that work. That's why I didn't even try smoking when I was on the RPF. I smoked on the when I was in the Sea Org off and on, very, very, very little compared to other Sea Org members. But when I hit the RPF, it was like, I don't get how any of you people are smoking. You know, because they would spend that 11 bucks on cigarettes. And I was just, some people on the RPF seemed to live on it, uh, on cigarettes. So I don't, I know, and they were, they tended to be older people, actually. It was kind of interesting. So I think the physical, I think their food intake thing, their, their, their metabolisms had changed quite a bit compared to us who were doing the intensely physical labor, the, you know, us younger whippersnappers. Um, so... Uh, so the energy that I needed, my body just adjusted to it, really, is what happened. And I started eating all the food that was being served to us, even the crappy curry, because I just didn't really care that much about the taste anymore. I had, um, it, was, it was actually kind of funny how some guy uh, on the RPF uh, who had been up from the int base, who had been sent down to the RPF, at one point commented on, so you only eat food when it tastes good to you? Like this was this kind of weird idea he had. I was like, yeah, that's kind of how I've lived my whole life. If I don't like the food, I'm generally not gonna eat it. And, um, and he just thought that was the strangest idea. So um, anyway, so I, but, I, but that idea by necessity kind of, you know, went by the wayside for me. And I just had to shove down whatever they were serving. And, and you just, you know, you get a healthy appetite with the kind of work we were doing. So, um, so that was how I kind of got by on that. And as far as the sleep goes, we had, I think it was seven and a half hours of sleep time from, you know, hitting the, the, the moment when your head hits the pillow to, you know, wake up call, lights going on, everybody get up and you got to go to muster. I think it was seven and a half hours. And you learn, again, through necessity, how to fall asleep. And of course, you're so exhausted at the end of the day that it's really not that much of a chore either. It was difficult sometimes. There was a guy who came into the RPF at one point who was a sales guy, been in the Sea Org for decades, and uh, had you know uh, pissed off the wrong person at the wrong time with some dishonest financial irregularity and ended up on the RPF. I think he ended up actually leaving the Sea Org uh, rather than finish the program. And again, good for him. But, um, but he was, without question, one of the most champion snorers I have ever heard. I mean, there were, the, you know, we were in a, with all the guys on the RPF were in a room with four high bunks, steel frame bunks on a, on a you know, linoleum floor, this was, a, this was a fairly cold room. We had blankets and stuff. Um, and this guy would snore like a freight train. I mean, I've never heard anything like it. It was, it was impressive. I mean, there were, there were other people who would get up in the morning and just be like, wow, dude, how do you sleep through your own snoring? I mean, it was loud. So he was waking up a bunch of people and there were a lot of people getting really pissed at him because he was messing with their sleep. And the only ticket out of the RPF is to get through those steps, which means you have to get in session, which means you cannot be tired when you're showing up in the morning for your sessions. Oh, by the way, that was another thing is for a lot of people, they would do their auditing in the morning slot. The, the bulk of the RPF was on redemption time is what it's called in the morning. So you get up, you go get breakfast, and you go into session. And that was, um, that was the preferred way to do it because you're fresh out of bed, you know, so you get sleep that way. Um, but when this guy was screwing up their sleep, I mean, this guy was, it was, there were a couple times in the middle of the night where I thought this guy was going to get dragged out of his bed and, and, and get, uh, you know, a code red. <laughs> if any of you saw a few good men, I mean, I thought they were going to beat the shit out of this guy. They were, there were some really pissed off people. And this guy was just a snorer. He was unapologetic about it. He just didn't see any, you know, any way to stop it. And man, that was a rough one. Um, I mean, there were some snorers. There were some other snorers. And I thought they were pretty bad until this guy showed up. Anyway, so um, somehow I think he ended up getting muzzled or something at night so people could eventually sleep. And, and again, the biggest thing, I mean, I'm kind of going over all these anecdotes here. But, but the bottom line answer to your question, Nick, is that I adapted 
to the circumstances I found myself in because I didn't have any other choice. And human beings are very adaptable. And I had been living the cushy life as a regular Sea Org member, you know, uh, which you guys all know about. So, you know, I'm being very sarcastic when I say that. But going into the RPF was a, was a, whole, a whole no level of, of awful. And, um, and I just adjusted to it. And I lost a lot of weight. I was very, very, very in shape when I got off the RPF. Um, I was capable of running up seven flights of stairs without hardly, you know, breathing heavy because um, we just did it over and over every day. Just, you know, just this, just this, the routine of work that we would do and, and a lot of varied work. It wasn't the same thing over and over again, but, but everywhere we went, we had to run and you're constantly doing push-ups and you're jumping jacks or you're running around the block or something because, you know, you're getting assigned disciplinary measures as part of the program. So, um, so I definitely got in shape and I definitely lost a lot of weight and I managed to get just enough sleep so that I could, you know, show up for auditing in the morning and say, yes, I am uh, well rested uh, or yes, you know, you shove enough food down your throat, whether you like it or not, so that you got a full belly and you just make it work. And then you supplement that with snacks during the redemption period. It's a five hour slot. So you get like um, protein bars, uh, again, non-sweetened ones. We get these rough, you know, they tasted like, <laughs> basically it tasted like eating ash, but they were protein bars uh, or something like that and vitamins. And you, you'd spend your money on this stuff in order to boost your metabolism a little bit so that the meter would respond when you do what you need to do in order to get into an auditing session. So basically, like I said, we just kind of made it work. And, um, and I didn't see too many people who were having real chronic problems with that. I think also the other thing about this that I'll comment on real fast is, of course, that Hubbard said the meter won't work if you're not well fed and well rested. But I think that was just another piece of the nonsense he had connected with that meter. Because we already know the meter doesn't, doesn't do what you know, Hubbard claimed it did. And it didn't work the way Hubbard claimed it worked. So why would it be that you'd have to be well fed and well rested in order for a meter to, to operate? I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true. So um, anyway, so that's what I can say about all of that. I hope that is a satisfactory answer.